Hello. Uh, my name's Sean. I actually work in our North America government practice where I lead all of our security efforts, making our products government ready. So can it handle healthcare data? Can it handle tax records? So one of the things we came to discuss was really how do we start taking open source, whether it's community or whether it's downstream enterprise, and begin making it ready for, for government. Um, and the second half of that is to start sharing stories. And, and a lot of the times when we think of government, it's this nebulous, nobody knows what they use it for, or maybe they associate it to only military use. So we wanted to start telling some stories about where uh, things like Fedora, JBoss, uh, OKD, even downstream OpenShift are being used, and how to start preparing community, um, as well as enterprise, for those use cases. So as part of that, uh, we wanted to start talking about healthcare first. And with that theme, uh, there's something called the Broad Institute. And what they end up trying to do is, through collecting genomic data, they try and cure childhood cancers as well as childhood birth defects. Uh, so they're one of the largest institutes in America. And all of this data is donated to them by patients around the world. So whether it's a child with leukemia, whether it's a child with birth defects, all of a sudden we're getting these, the personal health care information, their blood type, their name, uh, their medical situation, and we're storing that. So what Broad ended up doing a couple of years ago is implementing an OpenStack cluster. And what made them so interesting is they started with OpenStack.org. They were trying to build their cluster off of Trunk, and eventually they moved into uh, what is now uh, the community bits, RDO, and by doing so, by creating an open environment, about 12 years ago, uh, we started this initiative. And at that time, it took us roughly 12 years and three billion US dollars to sequence a single genome. When we implemented the OpenStack-based environment on community bits, we took that to roughly four days and $1,000. And we now opened up scientific computing to being able to find cures uh, quite literally for cancer. And as a result, one of the things that came out of this are there are four primary types of breast cancer. Um, without getting into them, there's four known. Because of this research, three of them now have treatments that lead to cures. And it all runs on OpenStack. And that's all happened in the past couple of years. So are these the kind of stories that you find interesting? Just thought I had nods. Yeah? OK. So when we have this patient data, there's a couple things we have to start preparing community as well as downstream derivatives for. Within America and most governments, there are actual regulated laws that say, here's how we have to handle uh, citizen information, healthcare information. And for us, in the US, it's called electronic, uh, electronically protected health information. And when we have this healthcare information, social security, unique identifiers, medical situations, we have to encrypt it. And any, whether that's encryption at rest, encryption uh, during network transmission, we have a federal standard about how encryption should be used. And it's actually a law, which means if we have community software uh, like RDO or OKD or Fedora that doesn't use the cryptography correctly, we can't use it in government which means all of the open source innovation that's happening, it's illegal to use. So we wanted to start dispelling rumors about, you know, can community bits and downstream bits uh, implement this crypto without having to be over military or over government? Is it actually community ready instead of uh, some barrier of entry? And to that point, if we don't use the, for example, the evaluated crypto, not only is it against the law, uh, it's considered plain text, which means if we want to do data sharing or when Harvard and MIT opened the OpenStack environment to share with European researchers, the healthcare information was considered plain text. So Europeans couldn't use it, South Americans couldn't use it, and neither could APAC, Asia Pacific region. Uh, so with that then, uh, transfer it over to Gabe to talk a little bit more about what FIPS is. All right, so typically what happens is when it comes to FIPS, validation, clean certification vendors will take the FIPS modules and go through a process 
to validate that yes, these are the valid fit ciphers that the standard has said and has declared that thou shalt use. Um, but this typically derives a cost, and it is an expensive cost, right? Because you're paying independent labs to go through and validate. So for open source projects, well, what are you to do? So up here, I have a list of some of the top modules that go through FIPS validation and certification. The most common one is actually OpenSSL. So if your projects use and enable crypto, my recommendation and what a lot of uh, open source projects will do is use OpenSSL. And you can actually go and check out with this very easy and handy <laughs> URL. So you can actually go check out prod, uh, products and modules that have been certified with FIPS. All right, so just some examples. Um, if your project um, might compile software, obviously at the top I have an example build target <coughs> where it'll enable you to open SSL. And like I said before, since it's the most commonly <coughs> FIPS validated certified module, I recommend using open SSL. Now, if you, as your project or application, might want to create the ability for administration or users or even your own development team to be able to specify ciphers, because maybe you have customers and maybe you don't want to do the ciphers overall in your project upstream, um, typically what's popular and recommended is to, in your application configuration file, create an ability for you or your users or administrators to go in and specify the cipher list. This way they can go through and say, hey, I want to specify the ciphers, um, and that takes the onus off of you and your project to kind of manage FIPS ciphers. Also, um, there was a presentation I think yesterday kind of talking about not rolling your own crypto. So in one of the videos are posted, I highly recommend doing that. It is by CML, so. no. This is just to kind of reiterate and kind of drive home what I'm talking about. Just read in the ciphers from the configuration file. And this is kind of done with But ultimately, um, going the distance, Fedora and Enterprise Linux now handles the ability to handle crypto policies with this crypto policy toolkit. And it's really nice as an administrator user because I just have a single command line and I just go type and say, this to FIPS. And any um, software configuration file that works with crypto policies will then set it to use the ciphers. This is an example at the top of an open SSH config from the FIPS crypto policy in Fedora. And as you can see at the top, it's setting the ciphers to FIPS. And then below, you, uh, you'll also see in the SSH config that it now includes, there's an include line, right? So you're gonna have to read in that config, um, the system-wide crypto policy. And below is the link to um, the Red Hat crypto project. So if you, in your project, want to start applying Ciphers and different ciphers, such as in compile uh, fix, you can upstream that and it will be supported in Elm Fedora. And that's handy, right? Because once again, an administrator goes in to set up fix, they just do a single command line, and once again, you don't have to worry about that in your project. And um, so on the FIPS note, one of the things is, and Gabe alluded, uh, within Fedora and RHEL, Red Hat will take the onus to upstream all of the, the current crypto ciphers and algorithms that are FIPS validated. So it's no longer a burden that you have to track at like the OpenSSH, Nginx, Apache, OKD projects. Um, as long as you do some QE or, or your CICD build runs with like crypto policy FIPS, you run your unit tests, assuming they pass, um, you're using all of the crypto correctly. So if you take a couple of years ago view, all of a sudden, projects would have to go to the government, check the cipher suite of whatever the latest validation was, and it was just too encumbered. Um, 
But one of the other stories is actually from the American uh, Aviation Administration. They're the people who run air traffic control and keep the planes in the air. So right now, at any given time, there's about eight to 9,000 different planes in the air heading to or from America, about two million people. And one of the things they ended up doing is migrating workstations um, to a combination from a, uh, a PowerPC-based platform to x86, and some of the workstations are Fedora and some of them are on RHEL. Uh, so by moving that migration, all of a sudden the system cost went from 25 to 3,000 US dollars. And uh, by using a combination of upstream open source, a lot of their developers are using Fedora libraries, some of their apps are built on GNOME, uh, they wanted to test on the latest KDE. And then when you actually have the air traffic control tower like at the airport, they're running on the enterprise bits for the support and all the, all the normal enterprise reasons. Um, but what makes them, I think, kind of interesting is that they started to measure uh, in, in the government bureaucracy, we have this certification and accreditation problem where even if they want to use different technologies, all of a sudden uh, they have to go through this government certification plan, meaning there's a catalog of certification controls like does it do password lengths for 13 character passwords and two uppers and two lowers? Um, is it doing memory management a certain way? And roughly there are 1,500 technical controls. So one of them could be something like audit privileged users. Well, what does that mean? Like what audit events do I have to capture? Maybe we do uh, user login and log out, but what else? So by the time you expand it to user login, user logout, add a user, remove a user, next thing you know, you're about 7,000 compliance items that every open source project has to document. And I don't know many who are. So as a result, on average, we found that it takes between eight and 12 months just to create the documentation to use something like OKD or OpenShift or JBoss because they have to do this. And unfortunately, that documentation is entirely in government spreadsheets with small fonts, about like 8,000 rows. Um, and it's insane. So what ends up happening is the first couple columns are like a requirement number, like requirement number one, requirement number two, number 2.a.1, and so forth. Um, so that spreadsheet has about 7,000 rows. They're color-coded about what's red, meaning hey, this is super important, are you using FIPS crypto? Put an X in the red column if you're not. And this ends up taking almost a year. So imagine what happens now when the open source projects, uh, like this week it was announced, you know, the next version of RHEL is going to six month cadence. We have Fedora, which cuts much, much more faster than that. Core OS upstream is basically every eight weeks or less. Um, <coughs> So if it takes me a year to make the paperwork, but releases are, let's say, three months, six months, I'm already a year and a half behind, year to a year and a half behind before I fill out my spreadsheet. So what we tried to do is to increase the adoption rate, uh, begin building open source configuration guides. And for that project, uh, Gabe? Yeah, so um, security configuration guides, nerd knobs, right? Document how to secure your application in any way and every way possible. And this is just high level like, um, for example, you can set my a character password to you know, a minimum of 10 length, or you can require that users, I don't know, use uh, special characters or uppercase, lowercase. And it's really just a way to document how can I harden your application? Me as a user, or the government, or as a policy writer, how can I come in and tweak the nerd knobs, if you will, to say, ah, this is how I can um, harden my, your application and code and make it more secure. And from there, typically what happens, and this is the bonus, you can create some security automation content alpha that or SCAP. And there's actually um, a project called Compliance as Code, which they did a demo earlier this week. Um, so if you can check that out when that's posted, that'd be awesome. Um, that can help you kind of create SCAP content 
for your project. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. As you can see, you know, it's talking about how do I configure um, capsule policy and pwequality.com. You can say minimum length, minimum class. And this is nothing that's related towards <coughs> policy um, like GDPR, for example, right? Or uh, common criteria. But from there, as you can see, you can get a red light, green light um, tree from an SCAP content, which is derived from the compliance code project. So now we have a way to take your security documentation and create a validation engine and tool that goes in and validates that per policy, your application is now hardened to meet those compliance requirements. And kind of what we do through that compliance as code project, uh, we're some of the developers on it. And when a project decides to partner with us, like EAP or OKD, which led to the OpenShift baseline, um, we actually translate all of that government 7,000 controls to uh, human speak. Like audit privilege users means the following 10 things, so we need to have the following 10 audit events. Um, and that leads to creating a configuration guide, like a specific set this setting, this name pair value, uh, or, or the YAML value for OpenShift. Um, and we do some of that with you guys. So it's kind of a call for collaboration. Oh. Um, so one of the things we often forget, uh, maybe by kind of head nods or show of hands, anybody know anybody, anybody know anybody who works on Gluster or Ceph? JBoss, Dora or Rel, SC Linux, IDM, all of that's running on the International Space Station. So that mission there, uh, last year, I'm gonna get the month wrong, so I'm gonna call it fall of 2017. We worked with HP, the computer manufacturer, to build a chassis, a teraflop of computing power that got launched by SpaceX to the International Space Station in roughly August of last year. Um, so what we're doing now is that consolidated uh, all of the compute power of our International Space Station module into that rack mount system. I wanna say it was like 8U. So what's crazy is by using, <coughs> excuse me, by using Linux um, and Cluster and Ceph, IDM, uh, there was like a JBoss component upstream JBoss, interestingly, uh, we're actually able now to build supercomputers on the space stations to do things like navigation control. Is there a solar flare and we need to shut down the electronics? Is there an air leak, which may, you may have seen in the press lately? This was the system that detected the air leak. Uh, outside of that, there's the Curiosity rover. Uh, so what we're doing in that case is actually all of the images that are being streamed from the Curiosity rover go to a GlusterFS, uh, uh, like the .org side of Gluster uh, environment, and they're joined with technologies from Nginx, uh, Railroad, which is a content management system. So whenever the public goes to view the Curiosity or any of the Mars imagery, it's actually using AMQ to send the message from space to a ground station. It goes to a GlusterFS backed file store, and then it uses Nginx as well as a content management system to send it out to whoever's looking at the web page. Um, so a lot of people don't realize, uh, by uh, late last year, one of the, one of the, this, this big RFE to add SE Linux policy to GlusterFS, and at the time we couldn't tell anybody why. Uh, we couldn't announce that the government was about to land on Mars for whatever reasons. Uh, but uh, it was actually uh, Lukas Freybeck, who I think I saw in the room, uh, added the SE Linux policies to GlusterFS, and now all citizens uh, of any country in the world can see the Mars imagery. So that's some of the backstory. But with it, kind of the primary takeaways um, does your technology work in FIPS mode? Is it part of your QE process? So oftentimes people will take like, uh, you know, Fedora latest, RHEL 7 latest, it'll run their CI CD on it, but it doesn't actually have FIPS enabled. It's a kernel option. So what we've started to do is publish baselines that meet the minimal viable government security standards 
where they're not overly militarized for one country or another. They're not over the top MLS or something. But you know, does it have some audit events? Does it have some SE Linux enabled uh, R FIPS ciphers implemented? And by using those images as part of your QE process, um, we stop running into issues where technologies get GA'd downstream, like satellite, which broke when FIPS was enabled. So all of a sudden, when Satellite 6 came out, nobody in the government could use it. Uh, when JBoss EAP 7.0 came out, nobody could use it because it didn't integrate with Bouncy Castle. So that's part of it. And then outside of that, there's a couple other concerns. Yeah, so... Questions, uh, I mean. Yeah, how many of you have a bank account? <laughs> how many of you have been hacked? Right? Hopefully... Oh, none, really? None, really, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the reality is today, this is more personal than ever. You, myself, everyone in the world is now vulnerable because hackers have now become a hot thing. And nation states and everyone else who wants to get your data, get your money, are kind of going after those vulnerable systems. And if they had complied or created a security policy, if they had done things like FIPS validation and certification and enabled systems with FIPS, those attack vectors would have been reduced, right? So now, more than ever, this becomes personal. Yeah. Versus just, oh, the government wants this and the government wants you to comply with it. Now it's more like, can we as the open source community, as the developers, Fedora developers, can we come together and start to say, hey, my projects, my code, my applications, I want them to be secure, I want them to follow policy, and I want them to do all the things so that in the end, myself, my friends, my family is no longer affected by these events. Well, we're seeing that institutionalized. So what once was for the American government, like you know, the, the tax collectors, the airplane controllers, all of a sudden now to get things like cyber insurance, at least in the United States, you have to follow the federal standards. If you're a regulated industry, like banking, transportation, telecommunications, federally regulated, you have to follow the federal standards. So it's no longer just a couple of government agencies. It's people like Verizon, Ericsson, um, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Visa, they all have to follow this now. So as we want our technologies to integrate into those spaces, um, these are some things we have to do. But with that, any questions? All right, thanks. <laughs>